ladies and gentlemen, here she is, the hilarious Kathy Griffin. City. I love this theater. I love the food. I love the people. So, you know, I'm going to bring a little local flavor, and I'm going to tell you that I got into town two nights ago, and I have, like, my favorite places that I go, right? So, I'm walking around, and um, I'm walking around with, um, I'm just going to say it, my boyfriend. Now, this has a boyfriend. It, it has sex and everything. All right, so, so first of all, um, we're walking down the street, and I'm kind of showing him your beautiful city, and we walk past your very own iconic First Avenue nightclub. And I know. So I, I think that outside Minneapolis, most people associate it with Prince and Purple Rain, and obviously they shot so many scenes of Purple Rain. And all these amazing acts have played there. So, you know, we're walking past. It's a weeknight about 11 p.m., and swear to God, not making this up, we were walking past the club, and then I see a guy with a cigarette going like this against the club. Okay, I see a guy getting a blowjob outside First Avenue. this guy getting a blowjob and as a woman and a feminist I want to stop it I don't like women to be treated this way and I'm trying to like yell things like get flaccid sir <laughs> that's anti-woman you should not use a woman like that that's like I don't know what I'm doing I'm like yelling at this guy getting a blowjob and then I look down at the poor like call girl having to blow this guy in 18 degrees there's like stalactites coming off his dick <laughs> I admit I'm a little curious to see the face of the poor person that like has to do this for a living and I'm not positive I'm not saying this is a fact I think it was Marcus Bachman um, tomorrow that's what's scary about that one all right look I'm gonna hit you hard right now with a story and this is a barn burner I have recently had a delicious run-in with Miss Celine Dion that is right oui c'est vrai Canadian songbird Celine Dion now Here's the deal, all these celebrities that I make fun of, I'm actually fans of. So I'm, I'm kind of full of crap because I might make fun of them all day long, but I still love them. So I will make fun of Celine Dion <laughs> and her husband, René Ogilil. <laughs> but I still love her, I've still, you know, seen the concerts and all this stuff. All right, so I decided to go to Vegas and see her show, and her show is fan Fantastic. I mean, she's legit. She doesn't lip sync. She's the real deal. She's awesome. Go see her show. But I also make fun of her. And to the level of, okay, so I can't prove this, all right, but it is on record that her husband, René Ogilil, started representing her and managing her when he was 38 and she was 12. I am not in any way implying that René Angelil was having sexual relations with Céline Dion when she was 12, but 
I certainly remember her being interviewed uh, by Oprah about the fact that she met her husband, Rene, when she was 12 and he was 38, and now they're married. So then Oprah famously said, Celine, I have a question for you, Celine Dion. I have, a que I have to ask you, I have to go there. And you know, Oprah will go there. And so she said to Celine in an interview, you know, everyone knows that, you know, you met your husband, Renee, when you were 12 years old. He was 38. And then Celine says, oh, you know, it is true. I meet my husband, Renee, when I'm only 12 years old and he is 38, but nothing romantic happened. We do not even have our first kiss until my 18th birthday. And I'm like, yeah, and your pussy. But, <laughs> well, that was in my head. I'm not saying that actually happened. <laughs> so, so anyway, I've always thought it was interesting that they kind of survived, right? But just keep in mind, that's the level of joke I've been doing about selling Dion. So when it's time for me to go to Vegas, even I'm not such an a-hole that I'm like at a call for comps. <laughs> After I've been saying that type of thing all these years about selling Dion, like even I'm gonna be like, hey, yeah, it's Kathy Griffin, hilarious comedian. Um, <laughs> I'm coming to your show. I'm going to need some free tickets, even though I kind of imply you've been banging your husband since you were 12. <laughs> Is that cool? Orchestra, thanks. Bye-bye. Like, even I'm not that person. So, you know, of course I buy tickets to the show. And about two hours before the show, I get a text from my lovely assistant, Tiffany, who's here tonight. Yes. And, and so I get, a I, I get a text from Tiffany about two hours before the Celine show that says, Celine heard you're coming to the show and she wants to see you after the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're right. You're right. Not one person here was like, oh, great. You were all scared and nervous. Every person was like, don't go. I know. You're right. But being a gay man, it's my job. If... <laughs> Thank you. If Celine says, come see me, I'm going to go. I, it's my job as a gay man. I punch in. I put my time in. I go home when she tells me. I get it. So, so sure enough, um, I get another text from Tiffany, and it says, they found out where your seats are, and they got you better seats. Now you're sitting next to Renee. like a pre-diarrhea feeling, like sometimes I have to hold my own hair. So um, that can't be good, right? Um, have you guys ever heard the rumors that her, Celine's husband, Renee, gambles away all her money? Yes, I've heard that too. And I don't know if it's true and I don't care. But, and I look at Renee and I'm thinking, you son of a bitch, you better not be gambling away her money. I love her, you better. Walk away from that table. You, that is Celine Dion. And I'm, I mean, I didn't say any of this. I'm not crazy, but I was like in a fight with him, even though he didn't know it and wasn't participating in any way. Did you ever do that? Get into a fight with someone that either isn't in the room at all or you don't even know? I do a lot of like imaginary fighting. All right, so I'm then thinking about the time that Barbara Walters asked Celine about it, and Barbara Walters said, if anyone saw this interview, you know, Celine, there are rumors <laughs> that your rather older husband, Woody Argelil, is gambling away all of your money, the millions of dollars that you own, year after year, singing your heart out on stages around the world, and that your husband, Woody, is gambling it away at the poco tables. Is this true or a rumor? Is it a rumor or is it true? And All right, so if someone said to you, did your husband gamble away, you know, $50 million, you would, you would say no, right? So Celine's answer was, well, you know, it is true. Renee has his gambling, and I have my shoes. And I'm thinking, okay, you didn't spend $50 million on shoes, honey. So now I'm very suspicious, right? So he's next to me in the concert. I'm looking at him like, you burn up your f***. <laughs> All right, so she does the concert. It's fantastic. We go backstage, and it's just us. 
Celine walks in the room. She couldn't have been nicer. Oh, well, you know, I am hearing that you are coming to my show tonight, and it is such an honor. I wanted to say hello to you because you make such the funny jokes. And I know, so I'm like, score. So I said, oh, Celine, I'm so happy to see you, and your show is incredible. And she goes, oh, are you touring as well? And I said, yes, you know, I love the touring. And she goes, well, you know, you have to keep doing what you do because we love you. You'll say anything because you are so crazy. <laughs> She says that to me, and I go, no, no, that's funny, but, like, you're the one who's crazy. Like, <laughs> that's why it's funny. She's like, oh, no, you will say anything. You go too far, and that is why we love you. You're crazy. I'm like, no, but you're, like, legit crazy. <laughs> so um, I said to her, you know, Celine, believe it or not, you and I may have something in common, even though people would think we are just so completely different. Oh, which is that? And I said, well, you know, you and I are both very kind of high energy and frenetic, and I move my arms a lot the way you do. And I kind of have this joke that, like, you know, people would think I'm on cocaine, but even if you came to my house with a gun to my head and said, you know, get me cocaine, you'd have to kill me because I wouldn't even know where to get it. <laughs> then Celine Dion says, but I'm not on the cocaine. <laughs> so I was like, oh, uh, no, no, I know. I, no one, <laughs> trust me, no one thinks you're on cocaine. What I mean is, and whenever you have to explain a joke, it's not good. So I said, what I mean is, um, you and I are both very, and now I'm doing sign language, very high energy <laughs> to the point where we move around a lot, whether we're talking or singing. And it looks as if we were on cocaine, but in fact, we are not. And she goes, but I am not doing the cocaine. <laughs> And it's getting worse and worse, and the boyfriend's like, mm-mm, just... And I'm like, no, no, I'll get her. So... So I said, no, I mean, the joke that I have is you and I are in the same situation, which is if someone came to our house, put a gun to our head, and said, hey, Kathy and or Celine Dion, if you do not get me some cocaine, I will shoot you. And then we wouldn't know where to get cocaine because we do not do it. Then she pauses and she goes, oh no, that is true. If someone comes to my house and puts a gun to my head and says, where's the cocaine? I am like this. Is it in the lampshade? No. Is it in the drapes? No. I don't know. And they shoot me and I'm dead. What was genius is my mom hammered watching probably a hammered Lindsay Lohan play a hammered Liz Taylor was drunktastic. I'm gonna use the word drunktastic. Are you warmed up for Lindsay? So first of all, let me just give you the Lindsay Lohan breaking news. And who knows what will have changed by tomorrow or the next day. But did anybody happen to see the tape online where she walks out of the precinct in New York with the jacket over her head as if she's fooling us and we don't know it's her? I mean, first of all, her, you know, plumped up lips like arrived at the car 30 seconds before she did. Why is Lindsay Lohan getting filler? She's 26 or something. Okay, so whatever. So, um, Lindsay Lohan got into a bar fight, allegedly, two nights after the wonder that is Liz and Dick on Lifetime. And if you haven't seen it, I have 17 times. So, I can tell you all about it. Anyway, so, supposedly she went to some nightclub in New York and punched a woman in the face, but the story is getting more interesting and multi-layered because um, she does the perp walk outside the precinct in New York. She gets into the SUV and all the paparazzi are yelling, did you do it? Did you do it? Are you a southpaw? Like these crazy questions. <laughs> Okay, so Lindsay gets into the SUV, and then apparently her assistant, Gavin, is in the front seat. Did you see this? So out of all the paparazzi yelling, you then hear Lindsay herself going, Get out of the car, Gavin! Get out! Get out of the f***ing car! Like, in the middle of all the madness of her maybe going back to jail, I'm, like, I'm thinking, honey, you got bigger fish to fry than whether or not the assistant's in the f***ing car, but okay. And then you see, I'm just going to assume gay and then you see this guy gavin just get kicked out of the suv and then the paparazzi is following him then he takes his coat puts it over his head and they're following him saying why'd you get kicked out of the car and he's like i don't know this is i hope she gets the help she needs and then they <laughs> So 
So then she like went back to LA and got like they charged her with several more things. I don't know what's going on, but let me just tell you this. If Tiffany ever takes a fall for me when I'm driving a Porsche on meth, <laughs> she gets to stay in the car. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> First of all, I love how these celebrities are acting like they didn't watch Liz and Dick, okay? I watched every frame, jizzed my pants, and watched it again, okay? I loved it. I had a viewing party that was so gay that the guests of honor were Jay Rodriguez from Queer Eye, and Sinks Lance Bass, and Glee's Chris Colfer. If you're gonna watch Liz and Dick, that's who you wanna be surrounded by. <laughs> and of course, the color commentary coming from your very own Maggie Griffin. <laughs> All right, so, so anyway, to watch Liz and Dick with my mom was hysterical because my mom thinks of herself as kind of like a Liz Taylor aficionado. So, oh yeah, I don't know if anybody else has a relative where they think that celebrities are their friends, but my mom kept calling Elizabeth Taylor Lizzie. So, she, my, by the way, what was genius is my mom hammered watching probably a hammered Lindsay Lohan <laughs> play a hammered Liz Taylor was <laughs> drunktastic. I'm going to use the word drunktastic. So, we're all watching it together, and then my mom is actually getting angry with the younger gays because if Chris Colfer couldn't list Elizabeth Taylor's husbands in order, my mom would like, f and take him down to Chinatown. I am sorry, but these young gays need to know that it was Nikki Hilton, not Connie Hilton, that married her first. And if you don't know who Michael Wilding was, then I got no place for you at my table. Like, she was getting really <laughs> upset with the young gays that didn't know their Liz Tree. Um, and then she would turn to Tiffany and go, Tiffany, hon, now when's this going to be released in the theaters? Like, <laughs> never. Um, oh, it's not. But, um, but anyway, I will say this, whether you saw Liz and Dick or any other Lifetime movie, I just want to say I love the Lifetime movies, and they have kicked it up a notch this year. If it is a Sunday afternoon, and I am sitting around wetting myself in my Forever Lazy, having just come out of my pajama jeans. <laughs> there is nothing better than watching a Lifetime movie marathon, and here's why. It's been the same movie, but with a different cast of actors, as long as I can remember. And any Lifetime movie that starts with Joanna Kearns or Judith Light, <laughs> or somebody from, you know, Pretty Little Liars. I don't give a sh who it is, but as long as you start a movie with the bulimic hero puking into the toilet, <laughs> I am a happy girl. <laughs> Those bulimics have it made. All right, the great thing about Lifetime is they instill a sense of fear about men that is really unprecedented, right? Here's, let me, t let me tell you about what Lifetime says. Their new logo is your life, your time. I think the implication is f men. <laughs> your life, your time. F that dude who thinks you're fat just because you had a fourth bag of Skittles. F him. <laughs> he doesn't deserve you. Take your bra off. You can argue later. Screw him. You know why? Here's what Lifetime movies have taught me that. If I'm a woman, A, I am going to be bulimic, and is anything better, does anybody remember that first one with Meredith Baxter Burney? <laughs> Me too! Oh, it was heaven, with the, where the camera did the close-up on the beads of sweat on her back when she's hurling up her cookies, and the kids are like, Mommy, are you okay? I'll be right there. Oh. <laughs> I love these Lifetime movies. Okay, so somebody is bulimic. So number one, it's essential that you're bulimic. And here's why. Because that man you married is not who you think he is. <laughs> yeah. It turns out that when you are obsessively checking his email, which is fine, <laughs> and you should do constantly, that you come upon an email from his other wife in Montana. <laughs> that you didn't even know existed until you click open and then you see a picture of his entire family. Because he's got four children you never even heard about, but that's why he's at the office all the time. And be careful having that coffee near your laptop because he's probably poisoned you. <laughs> and when the phone rings,
rings, go ahead and answer it. But guess what? The call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> so I look on Twitter, and at at share, it says, Kathleen, I need you to call me. Phone broken, iPad broken, time sensitive. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. As a comedian, I say this at great risk, but I'm just going to go for it. I know some of you will boo and freak out. I'm glad President Obama got reelected. terrorist calm the f down okay <laughs> look at the straights you give them an inch they take a mile now look no i just want to say you know i've been doing stand-up comedy for a long time and i don't like it that everyone is so sensitive about political issues you can't even make a freaking joke about the president that is wrong everybody calm the f down i'm gonna make fun of both political parties relax but you have to and i i just miss the days of clinton remember <laughs> You guys, you could make a joke about that jizz-stained gap dress. <laughs> I just get emotional thinking about it. I get nostalgic. So anyway, I, um, I actually recently was doing this one-nighter in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Or, <laughs> you should be nervous. I <laughs> basically got booed off the stage. But... It was five days before the election, and as you know, Florida's a battleground state, and I was um, performing at a school, and so I thought, okay, this is a school in Tallahassee, or Tallanasty, as they would say. <laughs> so I get in the car after performing there in Tallahassee, so then my boyfriend says, Cher just tweeted you. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about Cher. So... <laughs> So I look on Twitter, and at at share, it says, Kathleen, I need you to call me. Phone broken, iPad broken, time sensitive. <laughs> so she wants me to call her assistant. So like I said, it's five days before the election, and so of course I'm going to call Cher. She wants me to call her. So I'm calling her from the car in Florida, and I said, hey, it's me. Are you okay? What's up? We have to do a public service announcement. I don't want Mittens to be the president, bitch. <laughs> So Cher and I do this public service announcement, and we're trying to make it funny and keep it light. And we're not politicos, but we're trying to entertain you. But I got to say, sometimes I get, like, hate tweets or hate response that's so over the top, it just cracks me up. So I just wanted to share with you, no pun, I wanted to read to you a tweet that I got after the public service announcement I do with your very own Cher. Dear at Kathy Griffin, at Barack Obama, at Cher. Like, we're all having tea together, you know what I mean? We're all hanging out, trying on her, you know, fur vest from I Got You, Babe. So, this person writes, You and her are nasty, stinking, no good homo twats, good for taking a shit in your ginger hair. Okay, so besides the fact that that's hilarious, <laughs> you should know that what offended Cher was, I don't have ginger hair, mine's a really good wig. <laughs> so I did my little part. Now, um, the one thing I did was I got a call to do um, a Rock the Vote spot. You know the Rock the Vote campaign? It's been around like for a long time, right? So um, I said, oh, that's great, and who else is participating? And they said, Miley Cyrus. I said, what time? <laughs> so I show up to the Rock the Vote shoot, and I walk in, and it's this really small dressing room. So it's just Miley and an empty chair for me. And so, you know, I didn't know if she was going to be mad at me or sweet or whatever, but right out the gate, she was super nice. Now, what I love about Miley Cyrus that I think is so funny is she's a really good singer, but she has the cigarette voice. So I walk in and I see the hair. You know, you can't miss that yellow hair, that big, big, like, like it's like a, like a trucker cap almost. It's like something like, like a wing, like a bird's wing that comes out of her head. 
but it actually looks really pretty on her. You know what I mean? She's like 19 or 20 or whatever. And so she walks in, I see her, I see the hair. She's like, hey, what's up, girl? And she has this great speaking voice. Her singing voice is great, but her speaking voice is like this. And she talks really loud all the time. What's up, it's me, Miley. And I know. I was very excited as well. So, so we were talking and she had the engagement ring and she was talking about that. And I said, you know, I think your haircut is actually really cute. I'm gonna, you know, make fun of you for it, but it's cute. Hi, ah, you're right. So she was really kind of fun. And then it came time to do the rock the boat spot and they had her do the more serious ones and I did like the funnier ones, obviously. And then afterwards, I wanted a, a photo with her, like a professional photo, but I didn't want to ask her because I really made fun of her and called her like a dirty whore and stuff. So, um, <laughs> So anyway, finally, someone suggested that we get a picture together. So I said, Miley, is it okay with you? Sure, get out of here. All right, so that's how she talks all the time. So we go to take a picture together, and she's wearing this kind of sheer black top with no bra. So as they start to take the photos, every time it flashes, you can see her nipples. Now, of course, that's the picture I want. Um, <laughs> But because she's so famous, nobody really wants to be the person that says, you know, Miley, we can see right through your shirt, go put on a bra. So she's just obliviously taking these pictures and posing, and she's probably wondering why we're taking so many. And the photographer is like going, so I was gonna tell her, I don't know, we can't, we can see her, we can't use these for Rock the Vote. You can't have a voting campaign with this young girl with her nipples showing. So finally, I just go, Miley, I can see your tits. So I did. You can twat her and ask her. You can twat her tonight and ask her. So I said, Miley, nobody wants to say this, but you have to go put on a bra. Ah, oh, they'll edit around it. I go, no, they're not going to edit around it. Go get a bra. I don't want to. I go, get a bra. So, <laughs> so anyway, she puts a bra on, and we take the photos, and they were adorable. Okay, so about a week later, I got to see her again because I was presenting at this big music festival called iHeartRadio. And um, I see Miley Cyrus again backstage, and I've just seen her, and she couldn't have been nicer. Um, but I will be honest, she was there again not wearing a bra. So she's got on this really sexy slim skirt and like a black crop top, but I can tell the boobs are about to fall under the freaking fabric. And so finally I just say to her, Miley, are you without a bra again? Miley, we just talked about this a week ago. You've got to put on a bra. And then she says, if you had these, would you hide them? And... <laughs> I had to admit, the answer is no. All right, so... All right, so the other thing that happened on election night that I'm quite proud of is, um, you know, my beloved Anderson Cooper. He covers many important stories. I know you love him. All right, so on election night, you know, the, all the CNN correspondents have been up like 16 hours in a row and stuff. So the coverage is happening. And then just so you know that whenever Anderson Cooper is covering the most dire situations, whether it's Hurricane Sandy or Gaza Strip or a tsunami, that's when I decide to sext him. Um, <laughs> So they're doing the election coverage, and they've all been up for hours, and all the experts are there. So I decided to um, sext Anderson a picture of myself pulling my shirt down, showing my tits with my I Voted sticker. <laughs> because I'm an American. Because I love America. USA. USA. So, so anyway, he immediately texts me back and says, can I show that on my daytime talk show? I said, yes. <laughs> All right, so I don't know if anyone saw, it's now pretty famous footage, but when Anderson was covering the Gaza Strip conflict and there was that big explosion that went off, so he's on CNN Live, and I obviously I genuinely worry about him when he's on these assignments, so he's on CNN Live and there's a big explosion of light behind him and then a huge boom and he ducks. So they started running it on a loop and you know, I've talked to him about all those situations and I genuinely worry and I also think it's the perfect time for me to sext him. So. <laughs> You should know that when Anderson was covering the Gaza Strip crisis, I thought it would be appropriate for me to text him about a half an hour after the explosion where he barely survived, I'm bored, can we get pizza tonight? <laughs> I brought you his response. All right, so we all know how tense that story was, and there were lots of explosions, et cetera. So within minutes, he writes me back with, sure, come on over. My place is near the burning building to the left of the giant smoking crater. And they're all fighting, 
and it's kind of going the way you would hope it would go. Use is a whore. Use is fat. Use is ugly. Use is a whore. Okay, great. So they're, you know, they're giving us what we want. Gay crisis. Gay crisis. This is a gay emergency. This is a five alarm gay emergency. What was it? How bad was it? Was it like a. He's out. It's the late show, and the gay police will fix a hair. They will put the cherry on top, get the squad car. We are fixing this. Shit. All right, now I'm like, all right, let me know if there's another hair out of place because I'm going to have to live with this. So, look, we'll get to the housewives, don't get me wrong. We'll get there. But I just want to ask you if you've seen a couple shows that are maybe a little bit more obscure. Okay, first of all, has anyone seen this show? I think it's on A&E called Beyond Scared Straight. It's not a gay show. I know it sounds gay. That's why I started watching. I was like, yay, a gay show. It's so not. Um, Okay, so this show is so awesome. It was inspired by the iconic 70s documentary, Scared Straight, remember? Okay, so now what they do is they go like town to town and they gather a group of errant teenagers. Like, kind of like when Mori Povich used to have the boot camp. And remember they had those like snotty teenagers that are like, I'm taking money from my mom's wallet and I'm gonna stab somebody. Okay, so, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Okay, so. What this show does is they take teens that are close to being incarcerated for whatever reason, and they're usually really snotty and defiant, so it's kind of a fun show to watch and kind of gratifying, because you know some bad sh** when they happen to them. And sometimes they're like 14, 15, and they all think they're bad, and they all do the same interview. I ain't scared of no prison. Pfft, I'm gonna laugh in their face. Okay, so you should know that by the end of the episode, they're all sobbing. It's very gratifying. All right, so what they do... Is they put them on a bus and then they take them to a real prison and then they put them in the uniforms, right? So the kids are still trying to be bad and tough and then the guards come and get in their faces and that is heaven because when they have the female guards, let me tell you, those are some pissed off single moms who have been wronged by their baby daddy. <laughs> right? Have you seen it? All right, so they have some kid and the guard's like, What you in here for, boy? And then the kid's like, um, I stole some stuff from my mom, and then I beat up four kids at school. Oh, you think you're bad? You think you're bad now? You think you're bad? Look at me. Steal something from me. Go ahead. Try. Touch me. Touch me. It's... <laughs> Just got shivers. It's so scary. And that's the beginning of the show. So then they go to commercial, and you're thinking, how are these kids going to survive? So then the next part is, they take the kids, and they're in the uniforms, and then they take them to this, like, communal area. And have you seen this, where they're in, like, what looks like a cafeteria? And then the actual hardened criminals are in their cells with just that glass window, and they start banging on the metal doors. It is so horrifying, but delicious. And... <laughs> And so they sit there and they're still trying to act tough because the doors are closed. And so then the guards keep going, look at that, look at that, you know what they're doing? They're banging for you, they bang it. And they show these criminals banging. And then they showed this one guy, did you see the guy who had a scarf here and then a scarf here? And it was just his eyes and he was just looking at the teenage boys like this. And so the kids are now starting to get a little nervous, but they're still looking at the doors like, excuse me, but the doors are closed. And then they go, open up, and they open. <laughs> and then they go to commercial. Okay. So they come back from commercial, and they reach out, open up, the doors open, and then they let the inmates run toward the kids. It is fantastic. And they all start banging on the tables, and all the kids all of a sudden are terrified, and these inmates are just screaming at them, I can't wait for you to get here. You my bitch. What time you coming, boy? I can't wait. It is so scary. And I'm just going to give you a quote that I have never forgotten from Beyond Scared Straight. And I know it shouldn't make me laugh, but I can't help it. It just does. Because I'm picturing this kid, like, beating up his own mom. So the inmate says to the kid, I'm going to bend you over, spread your sh** and stuff it. <laughs> I don't know if you all heard me. <laughs> I'm going to bend you over, spread 
get your sh** stuff in! <laughs> Should we talk about the housewives? Okay, did anybody happen to see the reunion for New Jersey? Okay. All right, they're doing the Jersey reunion, and you know, it's going the way that you would expect it to go. So poor Andy Cohen is sitting in the middle, terrified for his own physical safety. I mean, really. And then you've got Teresa with her inch high forehead and all of her Cro Mag glory. And they're all fighting, and it's kind of going the way you would hope it would go. Use is a whore. Use is fat. Use is ugly. Use is a whore. Okay, great. So they're, you know, they're giving us what we want. But I gotta tell you, to me, what the reunion was all about was out and proud lesbian cousin Rosie. Yes. Yes. All right, so I. I love Cousin Rosie because she is out and proud. I love when she came out. Like, that was a big shock to everybody. <laughs> I got something to tell you. <laughs> I'm a lesbian. Like, okay. No. All right, so... So anyway, she's, she's kind of the lovable cousin on this franchise, but I did not know that she would really be the headline of the whole reunion. If you saw it, the reunion was a three-parter, and it was a barn burner. First of all, first two episodes are them fighting, 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 and they're calling each other names, and then Teresa says to, I think, Rosie's cousin, or in some way is inferring that Rosie's father is a liar, and he's passed away. So Teresa's like, oh yeah, well your father is a liar. And then you hear, and I know production, and I know reality and I know the stuff that really wasn't supposed to happen and I'm telling you this was a real moment because you hear off camera this rumbling that's like a rhino you hear this <laughs> frightening you could almost feel it like an earthquake and all the women are mics right except Rosie's the one not wearing a mic and you can hear her more than anyone <laughs> right on the couch so Teresa's like your father's a liar and then you just hear Rosie go a rip of it off! <laughs> you then see some production assistant, probably making eight bucks an hour, just going, she's walking, she's walking, she's walking, she's walking. And then some poor cameraman just trying to find Rosie, because they know that she's going down with Rosie, but nobody really knows where she is. She's not mic'd up yet. And you just see the camera work just following her dockers and lesbian shoes. <laughs> Here she comes, here she comes, here she comes! <laughs> and then she says, I'll go to jail for her, I'll kill her! I don't care! All right, it was so chilling and frightening. So she storms on the set. And I like how none of the other women were really adequately frightened. Like, did you know they were all like, whatever. Like they're getting a blowjob at First Avenue. Um, <laughs> So anyway, then Rosie shows up on the set, and she's really, like, threatened to kill several of the women. And then poor Andy Cohen is so terrified, because, I mean, and wouldn't you be? I mean, you've got this linebacker just coming towards you full bore, and she's livid. And Andy Cohen flinched like a pound dog in that ASPCA commercial that Sarah McLaughlin sings. <laughs> because when she really sat down on the couch, then she sort of simmered down and they all acted like it didn't happen. But previously to that, she's oh, kill her, rip her f Like that, it was so f***ing frightening. Yeah, I know your type. Do a concert, do your opera, big pussy magnet, Josh Groban. Get a hot girl out of the audience, get her to sing. I go, God only knows what you do to her afterwards. The special that I made last year, was up for an Emmy Award. That's right, and thank you. Thank you. And um, my special was up for an Emmy and lost again. But wait a minute, wait a minute. I know, I know. But here's, here's the beauty of it. I just want you to know, the category was kind of unwinnable, right? Here's what it was up for. I think it was Outstanding Variety Special. But I have to tell you who else was in the category. So, Betty White's 90th birthday party. <laughs> The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Kennedy Center Honors, who wins every year, 
Tony Bennett duets. Oh, no, no, the ad campaign was Tony Bennett singing with Amy Winehouse. Thank you. I can't, there's no beating that. As usual, I lost to the Kennedy Center Honors again. So I want you to know that after my stunning loss, I actually am naming this special Kathy Griffin Kennedy Center Honors. I could take it. I really could take it. All right, so after, after I lost uh, the Emmy, I went to, I still got to go to the Emmy parties, which is fantastic. At an Emmy party, I see, of all people, Josh Groban. You know Josh Groban, the singer? All right, so I love Grobes, and here's why. Because he lets me bust his balls, and that's my kind of guy. And every time I see him, he, to me, he always looks like he just left his own bar mitzvah. And so, um... <laughs> Oh, but wait, you should know this, though. Groves is one of those guys that, I don't know if you know this, he always gets super hot pussy. Did you know that? Yeah, like he was going out with January Jones when I first met him. Yeah, he's like that guy that always has a super hot girlfriend. Okay. And also, you know, he sells out concerts. He's great. And I'm a huge fan, actually. Like, I'm a big, dorky Groban fan. All right, so I see Groves at the Emmy party, and I'm really bitter. So I go, Groves, sit down. And he goes, how you doing? I said, well, I lost the Emmy. And he's like, well, how are you doing other than that? I go, who cares? And, um... <laughs> So anyway, but I can tell he's ready to play, and um, I said, hey, by the way, I, I looked up some concert footage of you on YouTube, and he was like, oh, I'm very flattered. I go, hold on, I'm, I'm on to you, Grobes. So it turns out one night I looked up YouTube footage of Groban in concert, and he does this song called The Prayer, and I, I, I guess it's an opera song, or what you would call an opera song, but what he does is he has a girl come out from the audience and sing it with him, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. So I say to Grobes, I go, Grobes, I'm on to your game. I go, I turn on YouTube, and and there you are plucking hot girls out of the audience to sing the prayer with you. I know you're f***ing these poor girls, you're disgusting. And so he's laughing and he's like, what are you talking about? I go, yeah, I know your type. Do a concert, do your opera, big pussy magnet, Josh Groban. Get a hot girl out of the audience, get her to sing. I go, God only knows what you do to her afterwards. And I swear to God, I know he was kidding, but just imagine this phrase coming out of Josh Groban. He goes, look, honey, this isn't going to suck itself. <laughs> Thank you!